All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Jonah Lehman. Um, welcome to my presentation. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties at CHS and my presentation wasn't recorded, um, but I'm happy to do it from home. Um, might not be as, as well um, rehearsed, but uh, bear with me. Um, so I recently did my master's under Patricia Chow Fraser at McMaster University, and, uh, and we've been working on this study for a few years now, and so I'm really excited to share it with you all. So this is the Blanning's turtle. It's easily distinguishable by that bright yellow chin, and it has a fairly wide geographic range. Um, it's mainly centered around the Laurentian Great Lakes, but it, there's a few small district populations towards the East Coast. Now, the thing is, is that unfortunately, in many parts of its range, the Blanning's turtle is threatened with extirpation. And this is primarily attributed to road mortality, habitat loss, and habitat fragmentation. And so we're seeing this large scale decline of, of these populations, and this has actually led to them being listed as federally endangered um, in Canada. And so the federal government under the Species at Risk Act has this, uh, this thing called critical habitat. Um, and the critical habitat is the, the habitat required by a species in order to, to carry out their critical life processes. Um, in other words, you could say it's to survive or for their protection and recovery. And so there's studies that we need to identify this critical habitat. And a great place to, to look um, at critical habitat studies is in Eastern Georgian Bay of Lake Huron. So Eastern Georgian Bay of Lake Huron is an area that has an abundant population of Blanding's turtles and a lot of high quality habitat. However, it's relatively understudied in comparison um, to the rest of Ontario. And, uh, and actually most studies of the Blanding's turtle occur in degraded landscapes in Ontario. And the thing with Blanding's turtles is that there's a lot of variation, when there's a lot of variation in their habitat quality and quantity, Having effective conservation plans, may it, it may not be effective um, if you're studying them in degraded habitats and you want to translate your findings to, uh, you know, critical habitat in Georgian Bay. You really need to focus on that site-specific approach. You want those site-specific studies to identify those site-specific protections. And, uh, and so Eastern Georgian Bay of Lake Huron is where our study is located. It's on First Nations land as well as their traditional lands, which are adjacent. This is an area with an abundance of high quality habitat, but also some areas um, that are moderately disturbed. Um, so we have some human development, including marinas, docks, cottages, um, as well as residential housing. And, and so the objectives of our study are to identify the anthropogenic threats to be mitigated and the critical habitat to be protected for this coastal Georgian Bay population. And uh, the way that we did that is through determining habitat selection and looking at habitat use. And so the, this is so that we could understand the site specific threats um, as well as habitat preferences. And this was during the active and nesting seasons. Uh, we also did have some overwintering data, but uh, I don't really have time to go through it in this presentation. So we're not gonna cover that. Now, the first step in figuring out all of this sort of stuff out is to figure out what habitats you have in your study site. And we were able to identify eight different habitat types we grouped them as. So we have marshes, bogs and fens, um, shallow water wetlands. These are kind of two habitats grouped into one. So this is anything that's shallow water less than two meters deep. Uh, but this is beaver impoundments, um, as well as the littoral zone or Georgian Bay coastlines. Now, we also have deep open water um, that's greater than two meters deep. This is uh, also known as lake. It's hydrologically connected to Lake Huron. And then we also have built up habitats, which are human development, forests, thicket swamps, and rock barrens characteristic of the Canadian Shield. Now, we want to figure out how Blanding Strolls are using all these habitats. And so we did that through our field work. Um, we studied 11 females and 11 males total, um, not all during the exact same times, but across the years of 2019, 2021, and 2022. And this was using a mix of uh, radio telemetry and GPS lockers. And so we, we tracked turtles um, during the active season, which was May to August, as well as the nesting season, which was kind of beginning of June to end of June, generally speaking. Um, and in terms of finding their exact nesting habitat, we used a mix of GPS loggers and community sightings to identify their nesting sites. Now I'm going to explain this idea of habitat selection and preference. Um, it's, it's really an important uh, component to this presentation. So habitat selection is where the habitat use by a population is disproportionate and compared to that habitat's availability. Um, and so really that's Kind of a lot to think about, but I like to explain it really as this idea of non-random habitat use. So if a, a species or population is using habitat in a non-random way, it means there's some sort of 
uh, pattern that's emerging, and we want to understand that pattern for conservation purposes. Now, you can further look a little more into it and look at preferences kind of within selection. So preference is a relative term to be used, um, and it's where selection would be uh, higher or significantly higher, um, really, uh, from one habitat compared to another. Um, and so you can actually look at uh, selection and preferences kind of at three different scales. So there's first order, second order, and third order selection scales. And for our presentation, we're focusing on third order selection. So that's where your um, available habitat is all of all of the area that is within a blending turtle's home range or their individual home range, and the used habitat is where we find them at each individual telemetry location. So we do we calculate third order selection uh, by classifying all of our habitats. So I classified them all here using object based image analysis. You can see this is our very large study site, and um, we determined habitat preferences using compositional analyses. So um, I'll go over some general habitat use findings. And, and generally speaking, males and females use a variety of wetland habitats across the active season. Um, so this includes inland wetlands as well as coastal wetlands. And this isn't something that's super new. Um, we know in literature they've kind of used both. Uh, but in eastern Georgian Bay, there hasn't really been literature that touches upon how commonly they use coastal wetlands, um, especially along the, co the coast of eastern Georgian Bay. Um, now, they also used, in terms of travel, uh, beaver impoundments as well as the littoral zone. Um, and this is so that they could access uh, different resource patches within wetlands, right? And so uh, we know that they'll travel kind of within beaver impoundments or, or these kind of open pools, but we, we don't really know um, that they'll use the littoral zone. So they'll kind of bounce around islands or coastlines in Georgian Bay um, to access different habitats. Thicket swamps were another one that we identified to be an important um, habitat used for travel between kind of these inland and coastal wetlands. Um, and something that was really interesting in our study was that we found four individuals make long distance movements across deep open water. Um, and this was to, to access, uh, you know, islands or different land masses um, or resource patches. And in one case, we actually had a female that crossed a boating channel just to nest. So um, we found her right after nest she nested alongside a road. She was next found three and a half kilometers away on the other side of an abatement. Um, and then she overwintered and the next year she came back and nested alongside a road again. Um, and so this is something that we, we don't really know happens in Georgian Bay is this kind of dynamic along the coastline of them traveling deep water. Now, in terms of active season selection, we actually found that habitat selection was significant for both sexes across the active season at the third order scale. Um, this really means that habitat selection was significantly non-random, and there's a pattern emerging that we want to understand. So this is our results from compositional analyses. It's a bit of a scary looking um, you know, figure here, but uh, I'll, I'll try to help and explain it. So you've got one habitat uh, or some habitat categories on the y-axis that are compared to one habitat category on the bottom right. And if you have a black arrow, going towards the bottom right or shallow water in this case, that means there's a significant preference for that habitat in comparison to the other one on the y-axis. So what you can really see here is that both sexes actually have a preference for using shallow water over most habitat types. And this is very much driven by the use of uh, these beaver impoundments and the littoral zone for travel. Um, now, nesting season selection we looked at, and we found that seven of 11 females made use of built-up habitats during the nesting season of 2022. Um, now, they use shallow water wetlands to kind of go to and from nesting sites, right? So your beaver impoundments in the littoral zone, um, but they also heavily use docks, marinas, and roadsides. Um, and this is something that really um, confused us and also kind of stressed us out. And, uh, you know, especially during the nesting season, we kind of expected them to use rock barrens, you know, for, for kind of nesting. Um, and... Uh, and that's what we know from literature that they will traditionally kind of use in pristine areas as kind of rock barrens for nesting. Um, but we wanted to test and see if there was a preference when, when given the option between the two. Um, so we tested for selection for six of these females with built up habitats in their home range. Um, the seventh we couldn't because we didn't have enough radio locations. And we found that there's actually a significant preference for females using built up habitats during the nesting season in comparison to rock barrens. 
Now, we actually were able to confirm that they'll use both uh, lichen-filled rock outcrops, right, those rock barrens, and kind of these built-up habitats like roadsides and things like that for nesting. But the, the thing is, is that the one female nest that we found in a lichen-filled rock outcrop was in a low disturbance part of our study site. Like, there was no roads there. And uh, and so that, that really kind of helps to, you know, um, bring about this issue, right? And, and furthermore, in this year, we tracked only six females, and they were only in kind of this disturbed region of our study site um, and had built up areas within their kind of home ranges. And all five females that were grav gravid nested within built up habitats, and two of them exhi exhibited site fidelity. And so what this tells us is that when available, females actually have a preference for using built up habitats in comparison to rock barrens during the nesting season. And this really poses a risk to the subpopulation as they may seek out modified areas with more suitable nesting conditions, which can act as an ecological trap. So in, in the end of our presentation, our study, we really wanted to outline the habitat that needs to be protected along the coast of Eastern Georgian Bay, as well as the threats that need to be mitigated. And so firstly, inland palustrian wetlands and coastal lacustrine wetlands, they need to be protected. Uh, blending strolls use them extremely heavily. And uh, in terms of movement corridors, thicket swamps, beaver impoundments, and the littoral zone really also need to be looked into for protections as well. They really rely on these for travel. Finally, for nesting, we also need to look at ways to protect rock barrens and potentially active roadsides. As we know, they really rely on them in order to for the population to recruit. Now, in terms of threat mitigation, I did some, some analyses in GIS, and I found that built-up land only accounts for 1.3% of the study site. But our findings of the study site indicate that this modified land use has a disproportionately large effect on the welfare of this blending turtle population. So we really need to figure out ways, uh, we need to strategize ways of mitigating the use of, you know, blending turtles using roadsides, docks, and marinas. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate uh, it, and I, I appreciate everyone that helped out in this project here. It was extremely collaborative, and so if you see your name here, thank you so, so much. Um, I want to thank our collaborators, uh, Moose Deer Point First Nation, um, and my friends from there that helped with this, this study. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to the Georgian Bay Great Lakes Foundation, as well as the Tadnac Club, and thank you to our funders, the Tadnac Conservation Front Foundation and the New Frontiers and Research Fund. Yeah, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about something kind of different that I've been doing recently um, since I started working with Christina. Uh, and it's this project where we're investigating the effects of phidiomycosis on the uh, eastern fox snake population in Rondeau. And we had this idea that, you know, could they be experiencing some effect that we're not observing because we haven't experienced or we haven't observed a large amount of mortality in the park. Uh, and so we wanted to kind of take a step a little bit deeper and uh, to understand what's going on. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge the land we're on today is the traditional unceded land of the Algonquin Nation. And the research that I'm presenting was carried out in the traditional territories of the Adirondack and Mississauga peoples that fall within McKee Treaty 2. So in nature, we all, or we all, animals all, uh, uh, have this trade-off that they need to cope with, with every decision that they make. There's various risks tied to each of these decisions that they use to access different rewards. And this can include things like access to, um, to food or to mating resources or critical habitat. But the risks that fall with that are things like road mortality, predation, uh, and as well as energetic expenditure. But when an animal becomes sick, there's an idea that maybe, you know, they don't quite feel themselves, right? Um, when endotherms become sick, one of the core responses that their body has is they develop a fever. Uh, this fever elevates the temperature of the body, and this inhibits microbial growth by itself, but also uh, it, it enhances white blood cell function and um, uh, to, to fight off the infection. But all of this is meta uh, metabolically driven. And so when we think about ectotherms, they can't do that. All of their energy is driven by the environment. And so they're not able to access those same benefits through generating that fever in the same way that endotherms do. And so there's this idea that maybe they can behaviorally induce the fever. And this is called the febrile response, but it requires these individuals to make more decisions and potentially accrue more risks 
So phidiomycosis, also often called uh, snake fungal disease, uh, is this dermal uh, fungal pathogen that's characterized by these dermal lesions um, and has had a wide range of effects um, from very minor to fatal uh, throughout North America. Uh, it was first identified in the pet trade, but um, within the last 20 years or so, we have found some in the wild and it is in Canada and, and many populations. Um, and one of the, or a couple of the, you know, common responses that have been documented is that, uh, things like increased water loss, um, through dealing with the infection, um, increased postnatal mortality, um, uh, as well as these, this potential, uh, sorry, um, but all of these things are species specific. And so in the population we're studying, we haven't noticed these things specifically. We haven't had direct mortality tied to aphidiomycosis. Um, but there's a possibility for sublethal fitness consequences. And so I wanted to test the hypothesis that uh, snakes will induce a behavioral fever to mitigate aphidiomycosis infection. And we predicted that uh, snakes with aphidiomycosis will maintain this higher body temperature compared to snakes that don't have clinical signs of aphidiomycosis. And secondarily, we're interested in um, if snakes exhibit positive signs of aphidiomycosis, um, if we can actually determine if they're gonna, going to be exposing themselves to more external risks and thus potentially increasing their overall mortality uh, at a population level. And we predicted that again, positive snakes uh, will, will expose themselves through more basking because of this behavioral fever that they're inducing. This talk is going to focus on the first hypothesis, um, but there's a lot of great uh, telemetry data that we are hoping to maybe take a look at as well but to start answering some of the second hypothesis. Um, the way we did this was we had uh, radio telemetry units combined with a wee pit data logger. And so you can see on the right here is this wee pit. It's a temperature data logger. Um, that we had set to record the body temperature every 10 minutes uh, for the course of two summers. And we had this in six snakes, four or three male and three female. Um, the wee pit itself was glued to the uh, radio transmitter using surgical glue. And then our vet surgically implanted the transmitters in the snakes. Now this is the raw data. Um, that we got from the radio transmitters. And it is very messy. But one thing I really want to draw attention to is how closely these snakes are modulating their temperature it, it, like re relative to one another. It's really, really close. And it's really, really interesting to me how well they're doing that. Um, when we take a step further and parse apart, uh, parse apart the snakes that had clinically positive signs versus those that didn't, we actually found that in terms of their maximum, their mean ma daily maximum temperatures, uh, there was no effect of aphidiomycosis. Uh, you can see here on the left is uh, the negative, uh, so no signs of aphidiomycosis. And on the right in the, the bluish is no, or they did display signs of aphidiomycosis. However, it gets a little bit more interesting when we look at the mean temperatures. And we found that the mean temperatures were significantly uh, higher for, or sorry, significantly lower for snakes that were displaying signs of aphidiomycosis infection, as well as the minimum uh, daily temperatures. And so this was really kind of interesting to us. We weren't entirely sure why. The key thing though, is that this is contrary to our initial hypothesis. Um, if they're not inducing this behavioral fever, and we kind of talked about a few reasons why this could be happening. But because this is more of a pilot uh, trial study, we didn't want to jump too far into making inferences about what these snakes were doing and why there was that difference. And it might not be biologically significant anyway. Um, so overall, the clinically positive snakes had lower daily minimum and mean body temperatures, but they did not have differences in maximum daily temperatures. Um, and so they don't appear to be inducing that febrile state or behavioral fever. And so as a result, they likely also won't be, um, you know, 
you know, exposing themselves to that increased level of risk. Um, again, I, it, we want to go a little bit further and see the look about or look into whether or not this is a biologically significant effect also. Um, but our next steps are to control for the ambient temperature. And we ran into an interesting hurdle with this. The local weather stations had a blackout of temperatures from May to September. <laughs> and so when we're studying reptiles, that's very problematic. Um, so we're looking into finding a, another weather station that's close by uh, so that we can kind of control for that and see if that had an influence. But also we want to look at um, the optimal temperature ranges of both the hosts and the pathogen. Uh, the optimal temperature range um, of uh, eastern fox snakes in Georgian Bay uh, from Rob Wilson's thesis was about 26 degrees. And the optimal temperature for uh, ophidiomycosis, ophidiocola, is depending on the source you look at, is between about 20 and 25 degrees. So there could be some impact of that as well that we're, we're kind of keen to parse apart. Um, this is a project that I came into long after it had been conceived and long after it had been, the data had been collected. So I credit where credit's due, but Rachel James and Christina, this was really, you know, their project and I am really happy to be, uh, kind of part of it now, but all the partners that have been involved, um, Dr. John Egan, I bet the Friends Organization, Provincial Park, uh, Rondo Provincial Park, uh, and, uh, everything, uh, deserves credit. So, uh, with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to chat. Thanks, Rachel, for that introduction. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, so we know that urban habitats are usually like bad news for wildlife. And of course, turtles are no exception. So some of the chronic threats that's affecting turtle species in urban habitats is uh, altered habitat quality and quantity. So for example, in urban habitats, we see a lot of fragmented habitats and also the quality of uh, wetlands. They tend to be like eutrophic. And the second point here is that uh, we also see a lot of subsidized predators such as raccoons. And uh, we also talked about road mortality a lot during this conference. And we know it's not only the adults that uh, get affected by road mortality, it's also the juvenile size classes. And the other chronic threat is the altered nesting habitat. So for example, uh, at the Rouge, we see like a lot of these nesting areas get taken over by invasive vegetation, such as dogs strangling wine. Um, so the confusing part here for conservation biologists is that not all of these effects of urbanization are negative. For example, we see because those wetlands are highly eutrophic, we sometimes see like a greater population density in these wetlands. And because food is also abundant, we see a faster somatic growth rate, which uh, ultimately leads to like these beneficial shifts in size classes. So you get these bigger turtles in a shorter time frame. And of course, there's this other side where some of these effects are actually neutral. So between urban and non-urban habitats, there's sometimes no difference in things like abundance, growth rate, reproductive output, sex ratio, or uh, stress levels. So let's make this even more complicated. Uh, we also have mass mortality events happening in these urban habitats. So mass mortality events, we all know what that is. Uh, so Greg talked about the mass mortality event of the uh, map turtles. So the common reasons are usually predation, disease, thermal stress, and also different human influences. So this is where my study uh, comes into play. So I studied a population of uh, four different turtles in the Rouge National Urban Park. So the Blanding's turtles is a head started population. We also have painted snappers and some red ear sliders who were, of course, uh, former pets. Uh, I looked at uh, five different things. So population size and survival, sex ratio, size distribution, and also biomass. Uh, just a little bit more background about the Rouge Park itself. Uh, there's like the chronic threats I talked about earlier. We also have the same stuff. So road mortality is a big issue. Nest predation by raccoons. Uh, habitat fragmentation. So if you've been keeping up with the news, you know, Doug Ford's trying to build houses right next to the Rouge Park. Uh, poaching is also uh, somewhat of an issue. Uh, and we also experienced this mass mortality event in 2020, where over 40 had started blandings and over 57 painted turtles were uh, predated by either a raccoon or uh, a mink. Uh, 
Uh, and we also know about the Blanding's Turtle Head Starting Program. So Rachel talked about it yesterday. The only thing I'm going to focus about here is that the sex ratio maintained in captivity is 1.5 uh, female to one male. And that becomes important later. Uh, in terms of methods, I focused on uh, three different sites. So site A, site B, and site C. And site A is where the uh, head started turtles are usually released. Uh, I did a four-year mock recapture uh, study. So in these three sites, I had different number of traps. But I, what I really need to focus on here is that in 2020, we really couldn't sample uh, site C at all. And site B, we were only able to sample for a week. And this really limited our ability to draw some conclusions. Uh, in terms of stats analysis for abundance and survival, uh, we did POPAN and robust design model. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> uh, sex ratio, we looked at uh, observed and expected ratio. So I used a chi-squared test for that. Uh, for size distribution, I used a histogram. For biomass, uh, I took the mean body mass of each species, uh, multiplied by the abundance I got from the models and divided it by the area. So this is our published manuscript from the Blanding's turtle population. So we only had Blanding's population in site A. So by 2020, we have released about 270 individuals, but the model after like accounting for mortality, we had a population size of about 183 individuals and survival during the normal year was around 89%, which is pretty good. Uh, but during the mortality event, this drops to about 43%. Um, so yeah, that's bad news. <laughs> uh, for the painted turtle uh, abundance in 2021, so this is after the mass mortality event, it, it was about 150 females and about 204 males. And survival was 58% uh, across all years. So the problem here was that we only had like four years of data and like one year we couldn't really sample very well. And you know, like population models require good data. So we were really limited with what we could do with these models. But what's interesting was that site A had the highest abundance and female abundance was also very high in 2020. And something interesting that we couldn't incorporate in our model is that uh, a lot of nesting females were predated, but they were also unmarked. So there was this sudden spike in like these females, like where did they come from? So because we couldn't really sample site B and C, we, we can't tell if they moved from here because we also experienced some drought conditions. So, or is it like evidence of some density de dependent regulation going on here? But I think like in turtle population, that kind of evidence is limited. So it's, it's really hard to say. Um, for the snapping turtle, we couldn't really estimate survival using models because we didn't really recapture a lot of them, but we counted the unique number of individuals and we found uh, 27 females and 29 males. Uh, survival estimates are unknown. We also found radiate sliders, uh, three females and two males. They were pretty big. Uh, so whenever possible, we rehomed them. And if not following like the per permits, we had to administer euthanasia. Uh, in terms of sex ratio, uh, the only instances where it changed from the expected uh, sex ratio was in, at site A, the Blanding's population. So one thing to keep in, keep in mind here is that incubation temperature was what we used to determine sex. Uh, and site A, the painted turtles also uh, shifted from the expected sex ratio of one to one. Uh, in terms of body... Uh, size distribution. So we have the carapace length here on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis. So for the Blanding's turtle, of course, it's a juvenile bias population because we are mainly head starting them. We only caught one adult female. Uh, for the painted turtle, we saw a stable size distribution. So males, females, and also a good number of juveniles. Um, and for the snapping turtles, again, we saw this adult bias size distribution. So what we need to keep in mind here is that uh, sometimes these size distributions become a reflection of our uh, study design and like the sampling effort rather than the true size distribution. Uh, but we did use like multiple methods to uh, obtain these, like capture these turtles. So I'm hoping that the, um, the bias there was somewhat limited, hopefully. 
Uh, in terms of biomass, so of course, the uh, we've been head starting the blanding turtles. So we saw about 11 kilograms per hectare and painted turtles were like twice as much. Uh, and not so surprisingly, snapping turtles actually contributed the most despite their low abundance. So that was about 60 kilograms per hectare. And I think they contribute more because we didn't really capture the whole population. Um, and we also expect the blanding turtle uh, biomass to increase over time as we continue head starting. Okay, so in conclusion, um, so our study provides a lot of like baseline data that's important for us to predict the trajectory of these populations. So no one has studied these populations beforehand and actually uh, estimated the population sizes. Um, and something really neat I thought was the finding was that, you know, these habitats were really small, like each wetland complex is like about 10 to 15 hectares. And like, despite this small size, they actually supported a really now large number of uh, native turtles. So this makes me think like we can't ignore urban turtles. Like we have to keep working on conserving them and they're like an important uh, part of the community. And the other important is like these urban turtles already experience like a lot of chronic threats in these urban habitats. And then the mass mortality events also can become like more common and more like detrimental with like climate change. So even in like small doses, like these kind of threats are really uh, bad for turtle populations, even in protected areas. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I would like to acknowledge all these amazing people who helped me with this project uh, and thank you for listening. Um, so my name is Kelton, and I'm going to be talking about hidden Markov model-based classification of blinding turtle behavioral states from multi-sensor biologger data. So as you can tell from the title, my study species is the blinding turtle, um, and we've heard a bit of, about it already today, so I'm not going to go too much into their life history and stuff, but um, we know there are species at risk threatened by habitat loss and degradation and also road mortality. Uh, and we also know they use a lot of different uh, types of wetlands, uh, both upland uh, and upland habitats uh, throughout their life cycle and different types between populations. Um, a lot of current studies focus on uh, large scale movements um, that often uh, are at a coarse scale, uh, which is really valuable for conservation in terms of habitat um, use and conservation planning. Uh, but there's a lot of modern methods and technology that can be incorporated into this, these types of studies that can uh, help um, provide a lot of more additional information. Especially when you think about disturbed environments, um, broad behaviors can also be altered in these types of regions. Um, so it's important to kind of look at that as well. Um, so traditionally, uh, a lot of behavioral studies uh, look at visual observations um, and uh, to collect it is usually done by tracking turtles. Uh, they're tagged usually by radio telemetry and um, following around and recording um, uh, a bunch of different behaviors and seeing what they're doing when you uh, trap them, or sorry, when you uh, relocate them. Uh, there's also uh, basking surveys looking at um, when they're uh, most often um, uh, out of the water and occupying different wetlands and trapping, which can help look at different um, activity when they're most active uh, entering traps and feeding um, and that sort of information. Uh, but there's also a lot of limitations with this type of work. Uh, the presence of researchers or their equipment can potentially alter the behaviors, um, as well as effort. It takes a lot of time tracking these individuals. And if you want to get a really robust data set, um, it, you can't be everywhere uh, all at once, all the time. So um, you often only capture a small amount of behavior. Another way is looking at kind of inference based on movement um, and sig signal acquisition. Uh, for example, from GPS loggers, um, you can look at, um, so you can infer different behaviors. For example, if you know a female turtle, um, if you get a GPS location near a roadside during early June and she's gravid, she's most likely looking for a place to nest. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, limitations with this as well, because you can't get these locations and signals underwater. Um, and so there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of time that you may not be able to uh, 
uh, infer these behaviors. Um, and also they spend a lot of time underwater. So yeah. And real realistically, we don't know what's occurring between each of these relocations. And so it's important to kind of dive deep into that and look into that. Um, there's also a lot of different um, broad um, variables that may alter the expression of different behaviors. Uh, for example, season, uh, some of the turtles can um, uh, be more likely to express certain behaviors based on season. Uh, for example, um, like trying to females looking for nesting um, sites or um, finding there's sex um, and energetic demands, um, temperature, uh, time of day, and also habitat structure, heterogeneity, and disturbances may alter and uh, influence the expression of behavior. Um, so the overarching, overarching goal is to understand how individuals interact uh, with their environment and how different habitat structure, homogeneity, and disturbances may influence an individual's behaviors. And really, I'm going to be mainly focusing on the kind of the first step of this, which is to classifying their behaviors. And so we used um, a biologger with which has multiple different sensors, um, and specifically, it's the AxiTrack unit um, from TechnoSmart, um, which is a European company. Um, it has some movement sensors, including a GPS logger, uh, an accelerometer, which can kind of give us a bit more uh, fine scale information, and then also sensors for the ambient environment. So including a temperature sensor, an analog uh, sensor, which kind of gives us a proxy uh, conductivity, so we can see if the turtle is immersed in the water or not, and a pressure sensor, which can uh, help us um, derive depth and where they are in the water column. And then there's also a solar panel on it, um, which kind of helps maintain battery life, uh, depending on the turtle's behavior as well. And so we attach these to a few different populations, um, but the classification and the accuracy is mainly uh, based on a single population in a coastal cattail marsh in Georgian Bay. Um, but we use a hidden Markov model. So it's a machine learning model that kind of looks for underlying hidden states. Um, and it incorporates a lot of different um, types of data. Um, so it's really useful and really um, we can throw in different variables, um, which is quite nice. Um, and there's some easy mechanisms to look at the effects of predictor variables. And then this can also be used in unsupervised and supervised context. And we chose to use it in unsupervised context because we mainly wanted to, um, like there's not always really robust training data. So maybe we want to ensure that it can be used in the unsupervised context. And so this has been done in um, a few different species, um, a lot of birds um, and some sharks. And the parameters of interest are often species-based, uh, based on prior knowledge. And so we focused on two parameters for the classification, a uh, variance in pitch over 30 seconds, which was derived from the accelerometer data, and if the turtle was immersed in the water or not, which was derived from the um, proxy conductivity sensor. And so we looked at um, five main states. So resting in water, active in water, digging slash nesting, active out of water, and resting out of water. And the model allows us um, to kind of input prior knowledge. And in fact, it kind of needs that as a um, stepping off base. So we assign two states to be immersed in water, and then the rest not immersed in water. The active states were high variance in pitch, the digging and nesting were moderate variance in pitch, and the resting states were a low variance in pitch. And then it ran a bunch of iterations until it found the most appropriate um, variables. And so overall, when we look at the four states, um, which is active in water, active out of water, resting in water, resting out of water, we got about a 95% accuracy, which is really good. Um, however, when we included the digging slash nesting state, it dropped down to 70%. Um, I should mention it, we were able to, um, it was, it did capture uh, all the nesting uh, events that we witnessed in the field, as well as some of the nesting attempts. Um, mainly the confusion was um, with the active out of water, it kind of classified some of that as nesting as well. So we're still working on finding another variable that we might be able to add into the model to help uh, just tease out that behavior a bit more. And so some, an example of how we can kind of use this data at a finer scale is 
Um, here's two GPS points of one of the turtles in a coastal marsh. And this first point um, was taken on May 18th at 8 p.m. And then the next was May 19th at 11 a.m. And the turtle traveled about 170 meters over a 15 hour period. And with, with just the GPS data, you really can't get at the why, when, and how. Um, but we can start to answer some of these questions as we, as we go through this. Um, so why did the turtle move? When did the movement occur? How long? And how did they get there? Um, so here's an example of some of the classification. Um, the y-axis doesn't really matter in this case. You mainly just look at the colors. Um, but essentially, we can start looking at some of these questions. So we'll skip Y for now, but um, when we when did the movement occur? The bulk of the movement you can see occurred at uh, in the early morning. Um, and in fact, how long they were inactive in the water for about 11 hours um, over this 15 hour period, active in the water for about four hours. Um, they were only active out of the water for a total of 20 minutes. And of that, only five minutes uh, were resting out of the water. Um, I should also mention these, ooh, there you go. These peaks here also coincide um, with um, surfacing events with the depth data. Um, so it's most likely uh, breathing events overnight. Um, as for the why, um, that's a bit harder to explain. Um, but if we go back to some of the larger scale variables, um, we can see that um, we can kind of tease out some of this information. Um, and this stuff is um, pretty preliminary because I still have a lot of uh, data to work on uh, classifying and also analyzing and looking how all the interactions and everything work out. But for example, in the coastal cattail marsh, um, they had a higher probability of being active in the water in the early morning and in the mid afternoon or late afternoon, and they were um, more likely to be uh, inactive in the water in the um, at both at night and also midday. And then also temperature can have a very can have an effect, um, which I don't think I have time to get into. Um, but also I wanted to look at uh, a different population had it at the same um, pre nesting season had a different experience a different probability of um, probability of being in a certain behavioral state. Um, so I have still a lot more work to do with looking at all the different variables and how they interact. Um, but we're really, we're focusing right now on um, how um, differences in behavior partition among different wetland types, uh, specifically natural areas. But then we're also looking to start looking at uh, degraded sites and disturbed sites that may have different um, uh, different impacts and how uh, their behaviors may uh, vary in those sites. And so we're able to explore multiple different behavioral states at fine scales and better understand how individuals um, and populations interact with and within their environment. And then also long term, our goal is to basically uh, help inform management decisions around how disturbance to environments have altered natural behavior regimes and inform restoration practices. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Erin Allen, and I did this project as um, part of my undergrad degree. Uh, my supervisors were Christina Davey and James Patterson, and my study species is up there. It's the common five-blind skink. So finally time for some lizards. So this endangered population of common five-blind skinks is restricted to the Carolinian ecoregion in southwestern Ontario. This region is known in Canada for its um, species richness across taxa, but beloved by many of us for its herpetofauna, uh, many of which are present at the northern extent of their species ranges, making them peripheral populations or subsets of their species present at the edge of their geographic ranges. So southwestern Ontario is perhaps, and honestly a bit disappointingly, even more famous for its roads, cities, and agriculture. The landscapes that continue to infringe on the remaining patches of native Carolinian forest and wetlands that amphibians and reptiles really depend on. Thus, these herpetofauna that remain are largely at risk and persist as small isolated subpopulations in protected areas that are widely distributed from each other. So like 
like the skinks I studied, which um, their habitats are marked in purple on the map. It's a bit hard to see, but they're all in the southern portion of Ontario there, um, with the site, my study site circled in red, and it's Rondeau Provincial Park. So considering that northern reptiles are restricted to a few specific locations, how do they move in their isolated habitats? I considered several factors that I think thought would really influence this. Firstly, their ectotherm biology. So as we all know, ectotherms can interna cannot internally regulate their body temperatures and rely on external heat sources. Um, they're also vulnerable to des desiccation and have small bodies that limit their movement. So thus they require pretty specific habitat with enough connectivity for them to access resources like food or nest sites and to complete life stages like mating or dispersal. Um, additionally, fragmentation can create barriers and disperse key features across the landscape. While being present at their northern range limit means that these reptiles face um, lower productivity, which can mean lower access to food and a more variable climate, which means that they might have to spend more time escaping poor conditions. So all of this means that they have a pretty dangerous life where moving can expose them to things like um, desiccation, predation, and road mortality, making it really risky to sometimes access the resources they need. So in addition to their ectotherm biology fragmentation that they face and the northern range limit that they're located at, the sex or age of the individuals may also influence their movement, as certain groups may have to travel more to access certain sex or age-specific resources, like nest sites, or perform age-specific behaviors like neonatal dispersal or mating. So my goal was to determine if the skink's movement varied within their population, such um, based on their sex or age, and if these potential variations in movement influenced their group survival. So to test to do this, I came up with a hypothesis that the nesting and dispersal requirements of adult female and juvenile skinks would require them to move more than adult males. I made two predictions to test this hypothesis. First, that female and juvenile skinks would travel greater minimum distances than males. And second, that female and juvenile skinks would have lower survival rates than males if they did indeed travel more than them. So the field methods for this project involved um, weekly mark recapture surveys in Rondo Provincial Park during the peak active seasons of um, 2018 and 2019. Uh, these surveys involved checking an array of wooden cover boards for the presence of skinks. These were placed in areas dominated by um, oak savanna, um, stabilized dunes, and the edges of hardwood forests. Uh, during the surveys, the boards were lifted, any skinks there were captured, and their photos were taken so that we could clearly see their head scales, as shown in the photo on the slide. Additionally, these photos were then marked so that we could um, ID skinks to the individual level, and then track what boards they had moved between. Overall, there were 380 total captures of skinks with 204 individuals identified from that total. So to test for differences in the distance traveled between males and females, we used a linear model with minimum distance traveled as the response variable and um, sex, as well as the total number of captures for each individual with an interaction between those as the um, predictors. So on the x-axis, you can see I have the two sexes with minimum distance traveled in meters on the y-axis. So the circles in the plot indicate the minimum distance traveled for each individual, which was calculated by summing the straight line distances between that each skink traveled between boards. Uh, the mean minimum distance traveled and standard deviations for um, each group are marked in red. And overall, you can see that there's a fair bit of overlap on these. So they, both males and females traveled pr pretty similar distances. Uh, we used a similar model to test for differences in the distance traveled by juveniles and adults, except age was swapped in for sex in the, as a predictor. So here we can see that some adults traveled all, much further than the juveniles did, but not enough of them and not really far enough to make um, indicate that they moved further. So overall, the juveniles and adults also moved pretty similar distances. Um, to test for differences in survival between these three main groups, so adult females, adult males, and juveniles, we used a Cormac Jolly Sieber model to estimate the monthly survival rates for each group, which were then scaled up to annual survival rates. Um, for those who aren't familiar, CJS models are frequently used to estimate um, population size or survival for um, populations that are repeatedly sampled um, using market capture. So in the case of 
my study, uh, the data was collected across 18 different sampling events. So the, um, then the presence or absence of any individuals informs these estimates um, that the model makes. So on the x-axis, we have those three main groups that I outlined with apparent annual survival on the y-axis. And just to note that this is apparent survival as opposed to just survival, since this model assumes that um, no individuals have emigrated outside of the study area. So we can't give 100%, like this is the clear survival estimate. Um, on the plot, you can see the estimates marked by the black circles with the 95% confidence intervals extending outwards from each of them. And as you can see, the adult female and juvenile survival rates are a fair bit lower than the males. So to conclude, the hypothesis that we lined out was incorrect in that female nesting and juvenile dispersal requirements didn't really require them to move any more than the males. Um, additionally, all the skinks traveled similar distances regardless of their sex or age. And female and juvenile skinks had lower survival rates than the males did. So if we think back to our skink from earlier, but give him some friends this time, um, and think about these results in the context of resource accessibility in Rondo Provincial Park, them traveling similar distances might indicate that resources are equally accessible across the landscape to all these groups. Or it might indicate that they're not really equally accessible, but the mobility burden is shared by all the groups. So they all have to travel the same distance to access things anyway. Um, despite moving similar distances, the females and the juveniles still have quite lower survival, but the mechanism driving this is not clear based on my study. Um, some possible explanations that I thought of might be the energetic cost of egg development or a potential increased threat to females while they're nest guarding that may cause their lower survival. Whereas for juveniles, uh, their small body size might increase the range of predators that can consume them based on gape limitation, or they may struggle to compete for resources with established adults or other conspecifics. So moving forward, some important next steps might include determining the cause of this difference in survival and if it's detrimental to this population. Um, beyond that, it might be important to um, enact more um, protections for these groups in the meantime, or create a bigger man management plan if we um, do find that the survival difference is really detrimental to this population. And then lastly, stepping back and thinking about this at like the bigger picture scale, um, all these individuals or all these groups, sorry, moving similar distances might suggest that other um, reptiles located at their northern periphery might also move similar distances. Uh, this lines up with other studies, um, one done on the same population by Brezzo and Hecknar that found that they also moved similar distances and um, similar to other studies done at northern latitudes on other species. Um, additionally, this contrasts with um, studies done at the southern extent of species ranges where males are frequently found to travel more than other groups. So thank you all for listening and thank you to everyone who supported data collection, as well as thank you to James and Christina and especially big shout out to James for collecting most of this data and sharing it with me. I really appreciated it. And additionally, I'd like to acknowledge the people who have cared for the land that this work was performed on. Um, the Rondo Provincial Park resists in the traditional territories of the Adirondack and Mississauga nations, whose care for the land, both historical and ongoing, uh, permits many endangered species like these skinks to persist today. So thank you, guys. All right. OK. Uh I'm, I was going to ask if you can hear me in the back, but it's usually not a problem. Uh, so um, what I wanted to talk to, to uh, uh, the conference today uh, about is kind of studying uh, amphibian invasions. And we, we know that studying invasions is important for a couple of kind of more obvious reasons, right? right? So ecologically, invasive species are one of the kind of five horsemen of the biodiversity apocalypse. And, and economically, they also cost uh, 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 countries a lot of money to deal with. There's examples of cane toads in Australia or kokoki frogs in, in Hawaii. But um, invasions also allow us to kind of look at a lot of, of, of curious kind of evolutionary and biological theories and kind of test concepts because they occur in these kind of tight time zones. And within sometimes, at least in the early stages, kind of a, a closed um, a geographic po population. And so my talk kind of dovetails with a couple of, of, of interesting ones. Therusha had some great points that like not all urban landscapes are bad. Some species really adapt to it. And, and our talk uh, of the travel log last night brought us to Mauritius, which is where we're going to go for a little bit of today as well. So 
a great thing about biological in invasions is most of them fail. That's awesome, right? So like the idea that as life travels through invasion stages, either aspects of, of, of the specific niche or the environment or biotic interactions cause these invasions to fail between stages. So whether that's transport or establishment or spread. So if you're being transported, if you're an animal on, on the docks and you get into a shipping container and move somewhere else in the world, you might not survive transport. Boom, that invasion failed. Or if you land somewhere and you can't find the right nesting habitat, once again, boom, that invasion tends to fail. I'm doing it just for you, buddy. All right, so the, <laughs> all right, so we, well, we can think of um, how these invasions happen. When they do occur, they occur for some particularly curious re uh, reason. And studying these phenomena are fascinating. And so invasion scientists have been coming up with different hypotheses to explain why it worked why that one shot happened. And for this, there, there's a particular one called the adaptation hypothesis that was put forward by Duncan's and, uh, Dun uh, Duncan and Williams. And it's one of these ideas that the invasion, uh, the invasion was successful because of a specific adaptation, which is a little no doy, right? Okay, it had an adaptation, it worked. Um, but the, the curious caveat that I like of, of uh, this hypothesis is because it could happen either before the invasion or after it happened, right? So there's a pre or a post invasion trait that kicks in. And so if we go post-invasion advantageous traits, this is when a, a population has established, uh, they've encountered some selective pre pressure, and we get directional selection for a specific advantageous trait that gets kicked into high gear. And so there's examples of things like um, a, a, a tiger mosquitoes that were able to change their diapause pe 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 periods within a period of about 20 years as they invaded both Brazil and the US. And there's other kind of examples that we could go into all day. Like it's a really fascinating kind of hyper ramp through changing to fit your environment. But pre-adaptation traits also occur. And there's kind of two ways that we can think of this. So there's one called pre-adaptation itself, was this idea was put forward that a trait evolved under one selective regime that's then co-opted by chance for a different function once they're within the native range. The second one is slightly different and was put forward by, uh, uh, by, by Hofbauer in 2012 called prior adaptation. And that the trait evolves under a selection regime in the native range that's similarly gonna be adaptive within the novel range. And this uh, uh, Hofbauer used to explain what they call the anthropogenically induced adaptation to invade hypothesis. So a quick rundown of this is that as species become more urbanized or, or more um, as they adapt to an anthropogenic world, it could be agriculture, it could be a city, it could be something like this. But as they adapt, they're picking up traits to live closer and closer to us, right? But in living closer to us, they increase their chances of being moved somewhere else in the world. So once they're moved somewhere else in the world though, they land more often than not in another human landscape. So they've adapted to live beside us. In doing so, we've increased the chance of them being moved and then we've increased the chances of them surviving those barriers along the invasion stage is because we dropped them off in another human space. And so I, I'd spent a long, a long time, me and my many collaborators that you have seen on that front page, trying to come up with like how we can test this idea. And we landed on guttural toads. So guttural toads are this large African bouffanid. Uh, they get like 14 centimeters SVL. Um, you know, they're pretty cute. Um, so they have this broad native distribution kind of across kind of Eastern Africa uh, from Ethiopia down to uh, South Af Africa. And they live across a variety of different habitat types from savanna to scrub to temperate to tropical for 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 forest. But one thing that's really fascinating about them um, coming from an urban ecology bath background is they're highly anthropophilic. They love living around us. And, and, and it, so much so that when you try to do comparative st uh, studies, I can go out and catch 40 toads in a night, and then that sample site's done, where it'll take me like three weeks to do it out in the bush. They're just easier to find around people. And, but because of that, and kind of fitting in the theory of what we're gonna be talking about, there's invasive populations. So there's a population that's been introduced to Mauritius, another population in Reunion, and these introductions to the Mascarenes happened uh, about a hundred years ago. And, and so they, uh, they were moved from Mauritius um, over to Reunion. And then for the last hundred years, those two have been operating kind of on their, their own, growing and spreading. Um, and, and the invasion in Cape Town, we're not gonna talk about because there's not really enough time. But if you can remember back to that 2020 year when we went, we went uh, uh, online for uh, uh, CACHS, I presented a, a talk um, about how we were doing work and we'd figured out that kind of this from comparing these island populations to their native genetic source in Durban, they had reduced in body size by about 30 per, 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 per cent. This idea of insular dwarfism occurring. And so 
we wanted to kind of take this data and kind of re-examine it and add some deeper layers to work into this AI AI hypothesis framework. So think back to kind of how these toads would have come to be there. They originally lived in their native range in natural habitat in, in Durban. The city grew around them and captured an, an urban population. And from there, we posit that it was unlikely that they went out to the forest to catch the toads to stuff them in a suitcase and bring them to the islands. Instead, they likely gathered them around that urban center. And then they brought them to introduce them to Mauritius in an attempt to control cane beetles. Didn't work. And then uh, then, then a, a wealthy landowner on, on reunion called up his buddy down at the docks in Mauritius and said, hey, can you send me a bunch too? I've got these pesky mosquitoes. Also didn't work. So then um, uh, then they went, they kind of spread outward of these uh, uh, urbanized human populations and then colonized the rest of both I uh, islands. So we have this hopping from natural to urban to urban to natural along their invasion route. And so we wanted to posit this idea of where along this invasion route did the changes arise? When did they start shrinking in both body, uh, overall body size and proportional limb lengths? And within that then, did these body shapes changes result in different locomotory capacities like speed or endurance or climbing. And so we reanalyzed our, da our, our, our data from about 500 toads that we had collected at kind of uh, the, these uh, six different site types. And, and, we, and, and we analyzed it looking within this framework. We then went out and actually captured toads and, and did a number of hopping trials. So one of them to look at speed, we'd take a toad and we'd place it in these five meter long racetracks and we'd chase it. And, and, you know, it's really it's a, 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 a paintbrush on a bamboo stick and you chase the toad. The first five meters was that escape speed. If a predator showed up, how fast could you get away? We then continued to chase them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until the toad could no longer hop. It reached an exhaustive point where you roll it on its back and it just said, kill me now, I don't care. And so uh, we again, again, I think uh, me, me and this is Carla Wachner on the GIF. In a period of about two weeks, we walked 35 kilometers in five meter segments. They're not, they're toads, they work at night. So we'd start at six o'clock and go until whenever we died. And so uh, <laughs> hopping and running and running and running and running. We also layered in this idea of climbing trials. There was anecdotal evidence that the toads on, on the island became better climbers. And so uh, a, a doc, Dr. Riley, who was uh, on this uh, uh, test, did all this cool be behavioral work where we take a toad and put it into a mesh cylinder and then the toad had the option to climb out if it wanted to, or if it was able to. And so we measured again about 200 toads to see if it just could, it could or wanted to climb out. So then what this led us to was this idea that kind of the wanting to test wh whether or not it was an adaptation that arose on the island or it arose before they got there through that urban fill alter. And so it looks like um, our results mirrored what our kind of earlier work said. These toads were smaller, about 30% smaller than mainland counterparts, and the limb uh, re reductions mirrored that. So they, they, they didn't differ based off of habitat type, rather just lo location. So it suggests that the island toads that had kind of shrunk in both limbs and, and body size, this was a post-invasion derived trait. Whereas escape hopping, again, followed that same trend, right? So I, uh, uh, in, in invasive toads were, were naturally slower. So on this, you can see um, the gray boxes are the urban landscapes. The green boxes are the, are the natural ones. And we have Durban, the native range, Mauritius and, and Reunion, the invaded ranges. And so we see this reduction in, 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 the, in their ability to kind of escape quickly um, occurring after they reach the, uh, the islands. And so before we go on to the next one, sometimes there's a trade-off, right? If you're really good at sprinting, maybe you're bad at endurance. And so after I saw this, I thought, oh, maybe there's hope for the next one. Not quite. And so <laughs> here the graph shifts a little bit. And so again, Durban in yellow, Mauritius in blue, reunion in this burgundy. And we see that, that um, they also reduce their endurance capacity. So they're slower hoppers and they can hop for um, um, a shorter distance before becoming um, uh, uh, exhausted. And at this point then, again, this doesn't seem to be a trade-off, but these do seem to all be kind of post-invasion phenotypic change. Climbing is where we shift gears a little bit. So it appears that, again, following the same regime on, uh, on the vertical axis, and along the, the, um, the, the horizontal, it's the probability of climbing out of that mesh cylinder. And so we see when they go from urban or from natural to urban toads, they increase their, their chances of climbing out of the, the, the apparatus. And that this increased climbing ability is carried through in the populations where they've urbanized within the I, uh, I islands. Maintained that at, at Mauritius, but backslid a little bit 
uh, or maintain that reunion and backslid a, a little bit on Mar Mar Mauritius. So what may have driven this desire to climb? The idea was pretty cool, right? They, they, they may have picked up a trait before they left. And once they got there, that trait allowed them to maybe um, uh, survive better and kind of get past those, 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 those barriers that, that, that many encounter. And so some of these theories come down to the, 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 this idea that climbing may have allowed for better navigation within an urban land landscape, that fragmented backyards and having to kind of hunt around. Um, there's other suggestions that was changes in, pre in, in predator type. There's different predator regimes in urban land landscapes and, and uh, invaded landscapes compared to their evolved natural norms. There's also some work that we, that we did on the diet of, of, of these toads that kind of suggest that they're, they're even foraging up the backs of trees and, 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 and we're finding arboreal snails inside invasive toads, uh, in, in, including one species that was presumed extinct for 40 years that was then found inside these freaking toads. Um, but this is a great ex example. I tried to catch this toad. It got scared, ran to the back of a tree and started to climb it. And that's Carla standing on the uh, 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 other side, none the wiser. If you are, 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 are looking to see some of, of the stats or a bit, a bit of a deeper dive into the hypothesis, definitely check out the paper. It came out just a little bit after CCHS last year. Um, I have to thank all of the many people. This was an, an army of toads, an army of people and many long nights. Um, but I wanted to leave you with this I idea. We found one tiny line of evidence for this uh, hypothesis, but we can imagine many other forms, many other traits that life takes, that as animals become more adapted to anthropogenic landscapes, through processes like urban evolution, we may well be priming populations to become better invaders in the future. And, and this may be something that becomes more per pertinent as we look deeper and deeper into how these changes and when these changes occur. And with that, I'd love to take any questions if I have time. Thank you very much. <laughs>